in a quiet Australian suburb, fueled by emu export and dreams of Bathurst, they come. Mad Max wannabes without the apocalypse. They are the suburban road warriors. And because of them, my local council has installed these. Thanks, guys. G'day, I'm Dr. Kev, and welcome to Car Design Workshop. Whether it's a pothole or a man-made speed bump, any disturbance that's in a road that's going to cause a vertical displacement of a single wheel has the potential to steer your car. And this is what we would call bump steer. If the steering system of a car is designed well, a vehicle will be able to go over bumps quite readily without any noticeable change in the toe angle of a wheel. But if you design it poorly, then you can have considerable toe change due to these bumps and disturbances. Now, I don't like these speed bumps in the best of times, but I want to guarantee that any car that I'm designing, the driver is going to decide where the car is turning, not the council installed speed bumps. Now, the key to bump steer is that when a wheel is moving up or down on a car, it's not moving up and down in a straight line. It's moving in an arc. This arc will have changing curvature throughout the motion, but at any given instant, its center can be defined as being the instantaneous center. Now, this is often presented in a 2D drawing, in which we would say this is a point, but we actually rotate around an axis, and the suspension acts as a three-dimensional four-bar linkage. So the more technical term for this instantaneous center is the instantaneous axis of zero velocity. The position of this is quite interesting and has a lot to do with the camber gain that we might have in an individual wheel. And that's something we may look at in a future video. When it comes to the steering, however, we want to make sure that the arm, the steering arm, is also aligned with this instantaneous center. And because the wheel is moving relative to the chassis, that instantaneous center does move around, so it's almost impossible to find configurations where the steering is going to produce no bump steer at any circumstance. So generally, this is a path to minimizing bump steer, not removing it entirely. When we have links that are moving through arcs, we see that there will be lateral movement in the outboard point. So we also need to make sure that the steering arm has a length that is defined by a projection of the wishbone points at its particular height. Now these are approximations and very small changes may be needed when you start to account for how this suspension is going to compress during a, say, a braking movement and we have some pitch change, or when we have the steering arm outboard point not directly in line with those outer wishbone points, as you would have with a car with some sort of Ackerman. When this comes to the design of the car, this means that the steering rack length and its height are incredibly important to ensuring that we have a good handling vehicle once we go over bumps. In the world of Formula SE or Formula Student, this probably means that we would just design our own rack and build our own steering system. But for Project 171, we're going to need to take a rack off the shelf, which makes this a difficult design procedure. Getting information about the eye-to-eye -eye length of a steering rack has proven to be quite difficult, as well as getting information about how much travel it has. Now, if you're not going off the shelf and want to get something custom, then that ends up being quite expensive. Adding to these problems, we also note that it's quite a lot easier to get your suspension to work well kinematically through motion if the wishbones are quite long and the steering rack consequently is quite short. But this means we generally want the suspension exactly where a person's legs are. This is less of a problem for something like a Lotus 7 vehicle where the front suspension is quite a lot forward of where the driver's legs are, but a particular problem for a short wheelbase mid-engine car. It's actually because of this that I've been doing these videos on steering in what may seem like very early in the design process. If we have a look at this example, this is where the steering rack is in a really good position. 
And you can see as the wheel is moving up and down that there's no noticeable, no visible toe movement. In this example, however, I've gone out of my way to put the steering rack in a really bad situation. The height is wrong and the length is wrong. And we see as it goes over bumps that there is quite a lot of steering movement here. Now, this is an extreme case where we are really trying to exaggerate how bad bump steering can get. And a good question is, how much is acceptable? And as for a lot of the issues around suspension, it really depends on the tyre that you are running. A tyre will generate its lateral grip as a function of slip angle. And this function is non-linear. What this means is near the peak slip angle, so near the peak force, a tyre ends up being actually quite insensitive to changes in slip angle. But close to where the tyre is pointing forwards, the tyre is far more sensitive to changes in slip. And this is the region we're working in when we're dealing with bump steer. So even small amounts of bump steer can generate a reasonable amount of lateral load. We also note that when we're going into bumpy uh, circumstances, we're often dealing with more than one bump at a time. And we're going to see a change in the vertical location of both the left and the right uh, tires as you're traveling over the bumps. So you can have a car if it has bump steer that is weaving from side to side as you are going over the bumps. While there might be some decent arguments for including things like roll steer in a vehicle, I'm definitely of the mind that we want to minimize bump steer as much as we can. Now this is reasonably difficult because the bump steer is quite sensitive to changes in the steering rack dimensions. Now in the kinematics programs that I've created, I had a way to change the steering rack vertical offset from its ideal value. And I've moved it through a range from about minus 40 mils to positive 40 mils from the perfect height. And we see here, as the wheel moves vertically, we see a significant change in the toe angle of a wheel. If we were to reduce this range and instead look at minus five to five mils, we still see a considerable influence on vehicle toe. And this means the height accuracy we want of our steering rack is less than five millimeters. Now this could be made a little bit better if we were able to make longer arms, but we are limited by how much space we have for the suspension system given its mid-engine arrangement. Now I've also created a graph where we can change the length of the steering arm. Now I've defined it so that the steering arm length is dictating the width of the steering rack. And so if I make a longer steering arm here, it's like having a narrower steering rack. Now we do see in general, it's slightly less sensitive than the height of the steering rack but we also see a fairly non-linear behavior. And this is because as the wheel is moving through its motion, initially, the steering arm will be pointed towards the instantaneous center. But as the suspension begins to move, it starts to point away from that instantaneous center and the error increases. So we see that the steering rack vertical offset was roughly a linear relationship, whereas the length of the steering rack is a nonlinear relationship. Now, if we look at a finer region of this, we see that even a couple of millimeters matters when it comes to the length of the steering rack. So what would be wonderful here is if I could design the suspension system and have a steering rack that is exactly the right length, then all I would have to do is worry about putting it in the right height and probably design something in so that the steering rack height can be shimmed up or down so that we could verify this bump steer during vehicle setup. And if I had complete freedom over the rack design, that's exactly what I would do. And this is the heart of the problem that I'm trying to solve at the moment. And that is that I'm finding it difficult to get this information for a variety of racks. The intent is the Project 171 will not have power steering. And that means I've got to either use a modern rack that I depower or I need to find a manual rack that is suitable. If you do have some suggestions, and ideally suggestions that include measurements of the rack width and how much travel they have versus how many turns of the steering wheel, 
I'd love to see you post them in the comments. At this stage, now that I have some insight into the steering and what I'm chasing, I'm going to be moving on a lot more into the chassis design to see if I can find some of the rack dimensions that I already have, if they could be made to work. And this is really part of the design process. You try and start with something, see if you can make it work, and if it doesn't quite work, you just have to change and try something else. I definitely think that bump steer is one of the most important aspects of a steering system, and would recommend, if you're working on your own vehicle, not to take it lightly and to put the time in to make sure that the rack is both in the right place and has the right dimensions. Thanks for your time.